Yes, okay. I'll teach you from there when we're going. You'll be in the zone. Go and get out of the tea. Let's leave for the tea. Can't be much going on, I'll go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody, wherever you are. A very warm welcome to our audience in the room here at IBS. And thank you. <laughs> that was horrible. We're in hyperspace. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> okay. So I hope that's not going to echo back at me in that horrendous way, <laughs> but it's an absolute delight to, to see everybody. Um, so welcome to this latest in our series of Sussex Development Lectures, which, um, as you all know, is focusing on the topic of global solidarities. What are they? Why do they matter? How do we build them? And this is a particularly important lecture, I think, today, because we're going to be thinking about the future of multilateralism um, at a time when many countries are pulling back from precisely that. I mean, the UK's international development strategy um, is involving a reduction in funding to multilateral institutions. Um, and we're seeing the same thing in some other countries around the world. And yet the world is facing um, a whole set of global challenges and intersecting global crises from climate change to pandemics to inequalities and economy that seem to require globalism, multilateralism. There's also a big debate about what the future of multilateralism should be, the institutions, the sentiments behind it, and our multilateral development banks, and our, our talk today is going to be looking partly at, at those, um, a good route to building global solidarities and what are they going to be about and for whom. So um, in a moment, I'm going to introduce our speakers and we've got a really fantastic lineup to take us through this topic and make us all reflect on it. Um, but I should also say that this today's lecture is organized in collaboration with another group, the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development. Um, one of IDS's um, biggest and most significant research programs, um, which delivers evidence and practical advice towards redressing poverty, hardship and exclusion that relates to discrimination on the grounds of religion or belief. Um, and Creed, which is partly co-hosting this, this lecture, um, is partnered with the Alcoy Foundation and the Minority Rights Group in West Semi. So um, before we start, as always, if you're on Twitter, please do tweet. Um, we're going to hear from a speaker and two discussants, but then we should have plenty of time for Q&A. So if you're online, please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, we've also got the closed caption facility available on Zoom, if anyone would like to use that. Um, and we'll also have questions from those in the room. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. So. Our lead speaker today is Michael Walcock. Um, it's an enormous privilege to welcome him back to IBS where he spoke a few years ago and he's now linked with us as part of the advisory board for the CREED programme. He's lead social scientist in the World Bank's Development Research Group. He's also an adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And he's been engaged in really critical and important research over many years on strategies for enhancing state capability for implementation, 
crafting more effective interactions between informal and formal justice systems and using mixed methods to reflect critically on complex development interventions and how to improve them. He also continues to produce a great stream of books focusing on this kind of issue. And the latest I think just came out last week, it's called New Mediums, Better Messages? Question mark. How innovations in translation, engagement and advocacy are changing international development. So we'll hear from Michael in a moment, but he will then be followed by two um, discussants. Um, Babatunde Omilola, um, who will be joining us online, is Head of Development Planning and Inclusive Growth um, at UNDP and a manager within the African Development Bank, um, which is the kind of main kind of role that was relevant, I think, to this evening's talk, where he's a key manager in the Public Health, Security and Nutrition Division. He's been involved in many high-level UN processes, and so his insights into multilateralism come from those, including the UN Secretary General's High-Level Task Force on Global Food. He's also worked at the, as the Africa-wide coordinator with IFCO. So I think Babatunde will be able to give us a really strong perspective on the regional dimension of development banks, particularly from an African perspective. And um, then we'll turn to Stephanie Griffith-Jones, who um, is, of course, an emeritus fellow of, of IDS um, and a long-standing um, researcher here at the Institute, um, although she's currently based partly in Chile, where she now sits on the board of Chile's central bank. Um, she's also financial markets program director at, at Columbia University's Inst Inst Initiative for Policy Dialogue. And her research expertise very much lies in global capital flows and also in the roles of development banks in that context. So what a great lineup, a very global lineup. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Michael to kick us off. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. And thanks to everyone at IDS that has uh, <clears throat> done their part to enable me to be here, uh, especially to Maurice and her colleagues uh, in the Creed Initiative, because uh, it's been my privilege, as Melissa indicated, to be on the board of the advisory board of Creed for the last few years and to speak uh, at one of its events. Uh, and it's a truly remarkable space that the Creed team has created, not just the leadership, but all the participants in it as well. And I'm, uh, it's magnificent because it's, it's able to do the rarest of things. And that rarest of things is being able to have hard conversations with people who in other circumstances, you might actually have some pretty important disagreements with. But in this particular space, you figure out how to talk to each other sensibly, reasonably. Uh, and it's extraordinary to be in a room of 500 people who uh, represent <clears throat> all manner of different belief systems of one kind or another and yet who find one thing that they agree on, which is that we shouldn't discriminate against people on the basis of what they do or don't believe. And that, that magic moment when you're, when you're in a room where that actually becomes a possibility, when you experience what it's like for people to have a hard conversation, stay with it, stay with it, and find a way forward, I think is the... Is the, is, as that particular challenge is, is humanity's greatest challenge. I have a forthcoming book where I, the subtitle of which is, is Navigating Humanity's Greatest Challenge. And the development isn't humanity's greatest challenge. It's the development messes with and ex enhances and exacerbates all the problems associated with trying to have hard conversations. And it gets harder and harder in the 21st century as we have more modalities of being able to talk with each other, but more ways of being nasty with each other as well. And um, we'll conclude on that particular note. But you've invited me here today to speak about uh, the <coughs> development banks and their role in building regional and global coalitions and solidarities, which I will do on the basis of a different project that I've just finished up with JP Singh at George Mason University. He and I, over several years, and with, uh, in the early stages with another colleague, were invited on the 75th anniversary of the Bretton Woods institutions to not let that moment be captured by the marketing machinery and sort of pat ourselves on the back and say how wonderful everything is, uh, do what researchers are supposed to do, which is to engage critically uh, with these kinds of challenges, but then not just do the, let's call it this, not the easier work of critique, not that the critique is inherently easy, but it's, it's, that can be consequential too, but 
Uh, <clears throat> it's different task intellectually. It's just in football, it's different playing defense as a playing to offense. So we are trained mostly to be critiquers in, in elite academia. We're not trained to uh, think about what things are sound, supportable, and implementable when it comes to actually proposing what an alternative to that might be. So when we were asked to do this particular project on the future of multilateralism, that was one of the, the principles we adhered to when we, and explicitly so, when we had an open call for papers uh, to recruit people to work on this particular or contribute to this particular effort to understand and provide a, a reasoned and evidence-based critique of what you did or didn't like about multilateralism, but to just not leave it there. Uh, compared to what, right? What else would, what would need to be done actually to enhance uh, or redress even that particular weakness or oversight or violation that, uh, that worries you so? Uh, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but my presentation is actually gonna be in two parts. Now I'm gonna talk about just some of the key findings as it were that emerged from that particular study, both on the critique side and then on the, uh, on the response side. But I think from my perspective, and when I sit in a very weird set of junctures in life, I, mean, I, I, as I indicated, I work in the research group of the World Bank, but uh, there are hundred staff roughly in the research group, 99 of them are economists and one of them isn't. And you're staring at the entire coalition of uh, non-economists in the research department, as it has been for 25 years. That's been my lot to be a, an ambassador, essentially residing in a different world, uh, articulating my, my country or my tribe's vision of how you do <laughs> what counts as a question and what counts as an answer, uh, and still trying to do that. I work at the World Bank, so people presume I'm a practitioner, and but then I also teach at the Kennedy School, and I have way too much respect for people who are actually practitioners to ever call myself one, but I like hanging out with them. I like having to work with them, write papers with them, uh, try to make stuff happen in countries, because that's they know way more than I do about what it actually takes to do a lot of the stuff that I say I care about. And I think if you're a student here, that's that's one of the things I would want you to take away from this is that is that praxis is a good thing, <laughs> that you learn things by reading lots of books, by crunching lots of data. You learn a whole lot of stuff just by hanging out with people, by entering into their umwelt, into their life world, where they reside, where they make sense of their world in their own terms. And trying this is a long way of saying perhaps that ultimately i think that's what the future of multilateralism has to be how it does that work how, to, how it has these hard conversations how it structures a space for doing that, that kind of work uh in ways that is uh very hard inherently for big organizations to do but which is very necessary if we're actually going to take seriously uh, the problems to which we are responding so the second half i'm going to you know is sort of invert things a little bit or just ask for what development problem are development banks necessary? And for what development problem is solidarity necessary? And if we start with the problem and say, what, what is the development issue that we face? I think that's a more fruitful entry point into saying, well, to the extent we have the luxury in academia of sort of having a bit of blue sky moments every now and then to pontificate about what, uh, what better might look like, what doing things differently might look like, and not just look like, actually be. <laughs> How would you think about then about doing that? Um, that's what I. That's why I work at the World Bank because I'm too impatient to be in academia all the time. I, I like being part of an organisation that exists on a good day to try and be part of a convening process of bringing all these different stakeholders together to try and have their own version of a hard conversation. But I'll use other different examples as I go along of what I mean by that idea and why I hope that will be instantiated more formally in whatever becomes the future of multilateralism. Okay, so I just give you a brief, I've already given you sort of a brief, a, a brief background on where this future of multilateralism and global development project came from. Uh, having uh, sought, as, as you heard me say, that we wanted to have people not only just critique multilateralism but provide responses to it, we also wanted people from around the world, we wanted senior and junior scholars, we wanted uh, people who could not just provide big picture uh, stories of geopolitics and the way that multilateral institutions are captured or not by dark forces of the world, <laughs> uh, but by the extent to which more prosaic everyday issues uh, are, are functioning. And what, what can we do to make the system, even as it is, just work a little more efficiently or a bit better than, than, than what might otherwise be. So I'm gonna talk a bit about, about that. Um, and then move, as I said, into the second part where I'm going to switch gears essentially and sort of uh, have a higher order 
look at the ways in which uh, the development problems of the world, I think should be the starting point for us now to, when we do rethink multilateralism, to think about it in terms of the fundamentally the problems that we're trying to solve. Okay. So with this particular project, we ended up getting 55 people from around the world to submit uh, their, their uh, abstract of you know, two pages of, of what they wanted their paper to be, what their contribution would be. We ended up selecting uh, 14 of those. And then we also went to four different commentators, senior people who had spent their careers at the nexus of, of research and practice and, was, and got them to think about, uh, provide some commentary on the commentary. <laughs> uh, what, what do they make sense of? What do they like about this? What seems to be working for them in, in this kind of now? Or, and or provide their own sort of uh, views on all these things. And so one of those people was Lance Pritchard. And if you know Lance, he's very happy to have all sorts of views on a whole bunch of different things. So we, are, we got some really interesting views from all those things, all those people, I should say. But we basically wanted to sort of do three levels, if you like. One was to look at what we can call the constitutive, the constitutive elements. Like what are the organizational structures, the voting patterns, the funding mechanisms that define these big multilateral organizations, in particular multilateral development banks. So those are what we, what we call the sort of the constitutive uh, aspects, what their organizational charts look like, what the demographic profiles of their staff look like, all those kinds of questions. And then look at the uh, what we call the functional aspects, the budgets, uh, how uh, funds come in and out of the bank, uh, how, in the case of the United Nations, for example, how the dues that countries are required to pay in order to be a member in good standing of the United Nations why do some countries pay their full amount and some just skate by and pay the minimum they can each year? Right? Mm -hmm. That might sound like a really kind of boring administrative question. If you're the accountant at the UN, I bet you would be loving this paper, <laughs> right? Because it's trying to, how do we actually get people to do the most elementary aspect of club membership? Pay your dues, like you, that's what the deal is, pay up. And so there's a wonderful paper from a, a German group that was all had this whole big critique of here's all the costs, here's all the weeping and gnashing of teeth about the inefficiency of the world of the United Nations that happens because it's always pleading poor. It doesn't have enough money to do what it does. Well, one of the reasons it doesn't have enough money is that a whole bunch of governments around the world don't do what they've signed that they would do. Right. So that's that shouldn't be an existential question to so say if you've signed up and said you'll pay it pay it. <laughs> what can we do to make that happen? Uh, what, are the, what are those carrots and sticks that might be mobilized to encourage countries to do that kind of work? So that's the sort of the level that we're trying to act at. If, if you've been reading sort of the global uh, foreign affairs and many of the other big international uh, relations journals and, and magazines over the last three or years or so, plenty of people are out there <coughs> calling for wholesale reform in multilateralism and then re redesigning the corporation, <laughs> trying to think uh, at a very big level about what that, about what the architecture of that should look like, but only in these very broad strokes kind of ways. No, no, or, or just critique. Nothing about okay. How do when I read all of this? How do I assess it? And according to the criteria that we use at the Kennedy School when we're assessing our own students' work, what are those criteria? Is it intellectually sound? Is it politically supportable? And is it administratively implementable? Right? Those are the three. When, I, when we read our master's students uh, and their papers that they write for us, they know from the get-go, those are the criteria. Intellectually sound, have all the evidence you can to populate and to make your case. Very nice. That's sort of the academic part of it. But then the real political work is who's going to support this? Who thinks this is a great idea? Who's going to be really skeptical? How are you going to either buy off or persuade those people that might be trying to stand in the way of what you're trying to do? What's, what's, the, what's the political economy of, of that world look like that you're now proclaiming to change? Believing that evidence alone is going to change things is an academic fiction, right? The reality is you've got to have a very good constituency that's able to make a very compelling case for why this should be changed. And evidence is just one part of the broader apparatus that you'll bring to bear on that. And then ultimately, does the prevailing administrative system that would introduce a new tax system or that would rethink pension reform or it would make schools work more effectively for people, can that world do what you're proclaiming it can be? Because it's nice to have aspirations, it's nice to have policy on paper, but there's a policy is only ever as good as it's implemented. So how well are the systems in place to deal with all of that aspect? And that was the <clears throat> that particular issue was the subject of a, well, of a book I did a few years ago on that on precisely that subject. 
So when we looked at, that was a filter we applied as it were. So all these different papers or when we, when we sent them back for second drafts and third drafts, those were consistently the kinds of criteria that we were applying. And <clears throat> we've ended up with these, I think very uh, nice 14 papers, four commentaries in our introduction, which will be out probably next month in uh, Global Perspectives, uh, uh, an international relations journal. Now I'm not gonna go through all 14 of these different uh, proposals or the papers that, uh, that came from that. That, would, that. You can read them or that would be not the points, I don't think for a lecture like this. I'll just, I'll just refer to three or four of them given the time. And then I wanna switch gears to a very different way of framing this, these kinds of questions in this higher order space of what is the development problem for all of which this kind of institutionalizing and organizing uh, matters. Okay, so uh, one of the ones that was done, for example, was a very nice demographic and geographic analysis of World Bank staff. Where they come from, what kind of degrees they have, where did they get their degree, uh, and what kind of work that they're doing, how fast are they being promoted, uh, what kind of diversity uh, is actually being honored uh, other than just espoused at the, at the senior level. Uh, so that was a really interesting one. They will do this historically and look at how the demographic profile of the World Bank and the IMF actually have changed over the last 20 years or so, right? Really interesting. Which of those two organizations do you think has been more progressive as it were in terms of hiring more, more, a more diverse group of staff? I would have hoped the answer was the World Bank. No, the three piece wearing suits of the IMF <laughs> win the prize if there is one for, <clears throat> for having, the more, having made the most serious attempts at really trying to geographically and demographically diversify their staff over the 20s. So the big bad IMF is actually doing some pretty good things. You probably didn't know that, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> but no, so that, is that, does that matter? In the grand scheme of things, some people would say that it's, that it's existentially important for the legitimacy of the organization to look like the world, to be able to speak the languages of the world. Uh, Others would say like, that then it's just you're you're just you're not really getting the always getting the, the best people, right? Yeah. <laughs> what counts as best in the in these kind of organizations and what kinds of problems we're addressing might lead to very different answers to some of those questions. Either way, it was just a, it was this is not a paper that's sort of calling for revolutions in, in multilateral institutions. It's just saying why don't if they're multilateral and they're trying to speak to the world and represent the world, why don't they look like the world? And what can we do to make that a, a bigger reality? Another one was looking at uh, the big trade-offs between uh, confidentiality, transparency, and accountability, right? So this, you would think, and most of us I would think, would think, well, it should be all the data the World Bank gets should be made available to everybody. It should be on the web. It should be able to be used by students. Uh, and for the most part, that's very true. Compared to when I was in graduate school, <laughs> before even CD-ROMs had been invented with data, you were still just transcribing things out of tables at the backs of, of world development reports. But like now the, all the data that you have access to for writing anything on anything uh, is available to you for free or a few clicks on the internet, right? There's a huge back room of work that makes all of that wonderland possible for you, uh, for us, for anybody. Uh, but is that always and everywhere a good thing? That we have more as the more we put the data into the public domain, the more we'll get, the more credibility and uh, accessibility we'll be able to foster. Well, we have a nice sort of contrarian paper around that, all built up around the response to COVID, for example, right? And actually saying if you want people to honestly report what their incidence of COVID is, right? You want that to be as, as, as confidential actually as possible. <laughs> Aggregate data might be released to the world, like or regional data, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America. But if you want every country to contribute, right? Are you, are you really expecting the countries that know full well they're gonna be at the, in the bottom of the list will be fully okay with announcing to the world that they're at the bottom of the list? Right? And this, this particular paper makes a very compelling case for certain kinds of questions for certain, not everyone, but certain kinds of questions where there is deep political sensitivity, actually we should be calling for much less transparency. We'd get much more honest data and more comprehensive data if it was actually secluded and protected, not made available to everybody. Right? Thought experiments, we could maybe talk about that even if this was a seminar class instead of saying, what do you think about all of that? Having done two years ago, being a co-director of, of the World Bank's Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report, I won't name the two big countries that actively withheld their data from that particular report. Why? Because they, it was embarrassing to them. They were a proud country that liked to think that their government was doing a good job on poverty until the data said they weren't, right? 
uh, rules and norms requires them to submit that data so that, that we can write big reports and make judgment calls around sustainable development goals around poverty and inequality and all the rest of it. Those countries, big countries, which means our regional aggregates were all going to be compromised, uh, <laughs> refused to submit their data because they were humiliated by it. Right? If they, would they have done so if it had been more protected, if it had been more uh, non-transparent? <laughs> Open question. We don't know what the counterfactual is. It's, the point for this was to say it's it's well, well and good in the most part as a general principle to promote greater and transparency and openness in the name of accountability. Um, but maybe there are some issues around which we don't actually want to do that. Um, the role of small states. Right? We live in, a, in, the, in the UN system, at least in the General Assembly, with one country, one vote. Uh, Palau and China have the same have the same voting powers. <laughs> one with one vote, four plus billion people, one with 15,000 people. Right? Is that democratic? Well, no, <laughs> but it's the way in which we've decided that the rules should work. How do we, it, it, given the, the, the real politics, the, the, the geopolitics of how uh, any big organizations uh, in the world function, how nonetheless, can, even with a, a one country, one vote kind of rule, uh, in other parts of the organization where those don't hold, how do we ensure that small countries that are still sovereign nations, and to the extent that's still the primary unit of analysis around which we think and talk about uh, each other and do this thing called policy, uh, should we have more or less engagements for uh, these this more or shrunk space for smaller countries, which uh, in, the grand, in the aggregate uh, numbers, in strict sense, don't figure too much, but as real people with real problems uh, requiring policy assistance of one kind or another, those countries want to be treated as we would all want to be treated. The golden rule applies to them as much as it applies to anybody else. So how do you set up a system that's structured around geopolitical interests to be actually really faithful and, and do due diligence to those countries that are actually <clears throat> very small and in some sense could be readily dismissed by others? So those are the, those are the kinds of uh, papers that we, we had written. And then through to the final one by Nari Woods, Dean of the School of Above Atlantic School at Oxford, who sort of does what she does, which is to sort of tell us what the, where the world's come from and going to in terms of how big power plays between the big uh, countries of the world are shaping the way that development itself is being, is being financed and the way in which it's being done. And there's a, now a versioning literature, as I'm sure you know, around the role that China is playing, notionally a, a global south uh, located country, but nonetheless uh, enormously influential player, um, doing all sorts of what, uh, end runs around the multilateral organizations in order to get what it wants to do. Are we okay with that? Is that is it okay to have everyone else constrained by international law and a whole 75 years worth of normative practices about how we engage with one another and have one other country just able to go and do all this other big work in itself? Or is that, hey, this is the way that's what what's what rich countries with white guys in it were doing 200 years ago. Why can't why can't the Chinese do it now? Right. So lots of big those kinds of debates, I think, are much more tractable. <laughs> They're much more real. They're where the where where the debates are actually happening rather than oh, we need to redo the entire multilateral apparatus. That, that doesn't survive the, the sound, supportable, implementable test to me. So that's what we kind of did <clears throat> with this particular series of papers. This was try to match the critique with the response. To as loud as you're going to be in the critique space, put your neck on the line and actually offer a, a credible solution to what that particular uh, critique might suggest uh, it needs. Now let me flip. I'm going to try and look at these bigger in the time I have left, just to uh, look at these questions pertaining to what is that in fact the overarching development problem for which any of the systems we have in place for doing this thing we call development uh, qualify? What is the problem for which these types of uh, institutions and, and procedures are the solution? And there I think, uh, and then uh, by an extension, given the title of this series, uh, what is the development problem for which we need lots of solidarity? Why do we need, why do we, why do we even use that language? Why not just sort of togetherness or work of cooperative or collective action and other more formal social scientific terms? Why do we need to talk in terms of a language of solidarity? And if we do, what's the development problem for which that kind of language becomes the necessary or invoked vocabulary that we use for these particular challenges? <clears throat> to answer that, I'm gonna open with, I'm just gonna give you two brief vignettes of, uh, two different episodes, one of which I was part of, one of which I read about, and, uh, and I would encourage you to, to do so as well. The one I read about is from a fantastic new series that the New York Times does called Headway, 
which is a whole series of every month they will launch a new wrenchingly complex development problem, both in rich countries and in poor countries, and just put it out there for you to, to, to read. Long form essay, but 10,000 words, but accompanied by video and all the photography and wonderland that you would expect from a well-funded organization that's even been better supported because a whole army of philanthropic organizations have given them boatloads of money <laughs> to really do this work very seriously. So uh, another book I just did earlier this year with Jennifer Widener and a colleague at the World Bank uh, on case studies and how they can be usefully deployed uh, in development research and practice. Uh, when we launched that book at Princeton last month, we invited two of the editors from this particular series, the Headway series, to come down and co-launch this book with us. <laughs> These guys are our sort of heroes. They've figured out how to create space for themselves where the case study becomes this modality through which they talk about big development challenges. This particular challenge was from Congo. And a group of Western scientists had uh, found themselves in Congo and had discovered that there was this massive big peat bog in the middle of one of the forests. A peat bog with enough carbon that it amounted to, quote, 25 years worth of US car emissions, right? So this peat bog is holding millennia's worth of carbon. And if it gets messed with, all that carbon is going to go into the air. It's going to be a climate, turn a climate catastrophe into a climate existential meltdown, right? Presiding over this village, uh, two, uh, presiding over this peat bog are two villages, neither of whom has particular clarity with regards to who actually either owns or has jurisdictional responsibility for this particular peat bog. Uh, none of them are very versed, as you might expect, in the details of climate change and what, what carbon dioxide is and why they should be concerned about it and what happens when it gets into the air. That's a different realm of claiming. But uh, at the same time as, as all of this is going on, there are other uh, in mercenaries that are walking around in this particular area paying individuals thousands of dollars to, to fell trees because the trees are, are very ancient. They have particular properties that are very valuable. Right? <laughs> and there's one guy, though, on the, on the team of the scientists who's actually Congolese. So he speaks the local languages. He is a PhD student, very willing and able to give you a perfectly articulate theory of climate change and why it's awful and what needs to be done to try and save it. Right? And so the whole drama is then is around actually what do you do in this situation? Do you pay the villagers not to do anything for the next hundred years because any touching of a, even a flower is going to set off this carbon bomb? But a carbon bomb is an is a entirely different epistemological universe to the one in which they reside in. Why should they do this for a bunch of crazy people who's come in and told them what to do when they didn't contribute to the problem and are probably going to then have to going to bear whatever cost is borne by this peat bog exploding. So in a, in a nice little wry moment in this case, they also note to the journalists, well, actually, isn't it true that you probably put more carbon into the air by flying first class to come and visit us here in Congo than you did by whatever we're not going to do by uh, tearing down a tree or two. Ah, nice little, they got, they got climate change enough to really see the irony in what this whole dialogue is going on, right? <laughs> so what happens in this case? You have, you have multiple different orders that are engaging one another, right? Why also should we protect the peat bog according to the villagers? Because our ancestors reside there. Right? Our ancestors are sacred people. We do not mess with the, we do not mess with the ancestors. Right? So the only person who can, with a straight face and with a credible voice, speak sensibly on one hand about the dangers of climate change and the awfulness that could, un could unfold if anything was to happen to this particular situation, is, will conclude that little narrative by saying, but of course, this is also where our ancestors reside. So it's another reason why we should be very supportive of it. Right. Those are two very different logics of claiming that all he's figured out in his own mind how to weave together without any deep schizophrenia. <laughs> all of us would be, I imagine, a little uncomfortable simultaneously holding those two views. Right? But by virtue of being this rare mediator, the one guy, the one person on the planet who can probably speak three local languages, English, engage with the Western science and engage with the ancestors, Right? He's going to be regarded and is regarded with deep suspicion by either side precisely because he can do all of this stuff. Right? Whose side is he actually on when push comes to shove? When he's speaking English, is he actually just dissing on us and we can't tell? Or when he's, uh, actually, when he's speaking Congolese, is he actually telling how awful these crazy what scientists are and, and expressing that they don't know? Right? But this is such are the stakes here that they kind of need to know the answer because the one guy who can actually be the mediator is the one that's that's holds the cards here. <laughs> let's hope he finishes his PhD. Let's hope he goes on to do good things. 
right? But I'll come, I'll, I'll let you sit with that one for a while. That's an extreme example, I think, of the kinds of challenges that we are increasingly going to be seeing in development. Very different orders, no very different normative orders, very different discursive linguistic orders trying to talk to each other and struggling because they're so different. They're ontologically orthogonal, to put it more formally. They are speaking to each other in very, very different kinds of ways. A different meeting, Canada, three months ago. I'm with a group of incredible people who are been designated by the Canadian government to disperse $26 billion. $26 billion on child and family welfare services in First Nations communities of Canada, part of a reparations initiative long overdue to for, by the Canadian people in general to compensate for all of the awfulness that has been perpetuated on those people uh, for so long, but often in the name of child and family welfare services. So this meeting is very tense, right? Because there's very different understandings of what it means to be a good parent. The Dean of the School of Social Work in Montreal gave a wonderfully thoughtful impassioned speech on what that looks like to, to a professional group called social workers. And very, uh, very graciously and joining in on this, on this meeting were <laughs> representatives from 10 different First Nations communities who listened, listen, heard this guy out and heard what he was doing. Uh, and then said, well, you will understand us if we're a little skeptical of this $26 billion. Last time you tried to fix our families, you uh, took the kids away from us, you put them in boarding school, you tried to change their religion and it kind of didn't work out so well. So kind of the burden's on you to, <laughs> to show us that you've uh, atoned for a lot of this and are in a better place to be able to start having a conversation with them. But it wasn't testy. All these people knew each other. All these people that had re recognized each other from other meetings that they've had over a long period of time. Second day, we got into a three hour conversation around one word, around one word, <laughs> one, one word, right? And I'll tell you what that is shortly, but the, the, the point of this was that you had this whole big discussion around one particular un people's understanding of what, that's, of what constitutes neglect, neglect. That's the magic word. Where's the line? You're getting $26 billion. You have a freight train of administrative law whole series of normative expectations, a whole series of rules and reports and everything else, the evaluations, everything that goes with getting $26 billion. Anyone who's managed government money knows full well what that feels like, right? Unbelievably onerous. <laughs> Some poor people have to put their hands up and say, yeah, that's my job. I've got, to, I've got to be, I'm accountable for this. I have to write the report on all of this. Where does this neglect start and where does it end? Right? Who actually has the job of going into a family, a First Nations family in Saskatchewan in the middle of February and saying, Sorry, this family is sufficiently dysfunctional. Too many whiskey bottles, too many bruises on the kids. It's my job, unfortunately, to take you away from your parents, break the most sacred bond that we have and put you, make you wards of the state because you've crossed the line, right? Wow, that's about as hard as it could get. That's harder than rocket science. It's harder than brain surgery to figure out what the right response to that is without blowing everything up. <laughs> Three hours into a discussion on one word, right? You can feel the tension in this room, but it's good tension. It's, it's not, no one's being a jerk. No one's being something they're not supposed to be. Everyone's being an authentic representative of their particular view. But you have 10 different First Nations communities there because they've got 10 different views, actually, on where that line should be drawn. A government is, cannot deal with that. It, it cannot deal, World Bank can't deal with that. It can only deal with very discrete categories. It can't deal with continuous variables, <laughs> continuous key variables. You want to put it in formal social scientific wording. And it has to have platforms and mechanisms by which that can be distributed. It has to, there has to be channels that can absorb $26 billion and funnel them out around different communities. But how do you do that when it's roads? That's hard enough. How do you do it when it's my children that you're now funding <laughs> or potentially funding other people to come into my world and take those children away from because your version of, of neglect doesn't square with my version of neglect? Oh. <laughs> one of the best meetings I've ever been to because it was hard, because everybody didn't regard the other person in the room as evil and who was ideologically unsound or not fit to be there because they all knew each other. There was a space this, this, this group of 20 people had created where they wanted to make that work, when they wanted that to make that work. So I think what I've just described actually is, is, not, is four different types of communicative orders, different, different ways in which different kinds of groups talk to each other in ways that make sense. Right? One of those is the academic order, what we're speaking now. Everyone in this room has about 16,000 hours of education. That's how long it took to teach your mind how to hear what I'm hearing and think, that's eh, sort of academic. 
<laughs> and you, nobody is outraged yet. Uh, you're, you're hearing a particular discourse that resonates with you because that's how people at RDS talk to each other. Right? That's academic discourse. You learn that. You're socialized into it. You become a good academic if you learn how to speak the right speak. And everybody nods and agrees. Then, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's very different from official order, the, the, the language of government, the language of administrative law, the language of categories, the language of territories, the language of, 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 of very just particular kinds of boxes that have to do all this work of administering $26 billion. You have to administer the work of a peat bog. They can't deal with all this, all this variation. They, they, need, they, don't, like, they, they don't need singularities necessarily, though that's better if it is, but they need some fixed categories, something manageable that, that can be legible in Jim Scott's famous words from uh, seeing like a state. Right, so you have academic order, official order, and you have vernacular order. You have the, word, the, the vernacular, the ways in which people engage with their world on an everyday basis. We all have a vernacular. Your family has a vernacular. <laughs> you speak to each other in very particular kinds of ways. You speak, in my case, to my children with nicknames and all that sort of stuff that nobody else knows or cares about. It's a vernacular language. It's a vernacular language that manages a peat bog in, in the middle of Congo right now. Right? That's a vernacular that it can incorporate the ancestors seamlessly without any weirdness of thinking that's that's superstition. It's not that, that concept doesn't even exist in their repertoire. That that, that is superstition. The ancestors, of course, they reside in the people. They've always resided there. Don't you think that too? You're the weird one if you don't think that. <laughs> right? So you have vernacular knowledge. You have official knowledge. You have you, and you have uh, academic order. Then you have popular order. You have the way in which all of this is then represented in popular culture through songs, through music, through novels, through plays. The ways in which masses of people then start to apprehend their world. And I think that's where, this is a long way of saying, this is all where, this is the kind of the vernacular challenges and clashings of different orders that we live with in the 21st century. We've always had them. Now they're just on steroids. Now they're able to be amplified through social media. And that's the big development challenge. The is accelerating all of that stuff. Every thing we celebrate when a new village gets access to an online portal to get microfinance. Everything else channels through that same little pipeline as well. <laughs> all the bad stuff in the world goes through there. All the hate speech, all of the awfulness that's a very different kind of vernacular, a very different kind of order is all traveling in that space. So you, we all need to be able to do very hard work. We have to be able to apprehend very quickly what kind of normative order we are in at any given moment. And that's hard for humans to do and historically not what humans had to do. They didn't have to live almost schizophrenically and bouncing around all these different kinds of normative orders, but that's the world that we've created, what development has created by getting people out of poverty, by promoting economic growth, by <laughs> moving people into cities. All of this, all the standard well understood processes of development have enhanced this situation, which is not going to go away, but only be intensified, it seems to me, in the coming decades around, around, uh, around what we need to do. So when we're thinking about the future of our multilateral development banks, yes, there are all these procedural issues that I laid out at the beginning and the, we need to have more demographic staff and we need to be more accommodating of small states and we need to have, have better ways of portioning the dues, all those things that will help that system work really well. But all of that seems to be, if we ask what is the development problem for which these are the, the responses right now, we've got a whole series of peak bog type issues waiting to blow. <laughs> we've got a whole bunch of neglect issues waiting to blow. And that is gonna require a very different kind of modality of engagement. What's my response to all that to be consistent with what I've just said? Um, <clears throat> I think trying to enhance the legitimacy of alternative epistemological entry points into that space. If, it's, if you only believe what comes out of a regression model as serious science and you think that's all that really, really matters. That's the rigorous work. That's all I really care about. Then I think you're restricting the space. You're restricting the, the, the array of ways in which we can decide what counts as questions and what counts as answer. This is not a relativist argument. Every, anything goes, you can do whatever you want. I want science as much as anybody else does, but you want to be able to hold together these very different ways of apprehending the world and making sense of it. And I think that's the kind of work that we need to do as development professionals and embody that. I think our organizations need to embody that. And to the extent that they double down on just being official order organizations, or in my case, in the research group, uh, <clears throat> versions of just an academic order, then we miss, we don't hear, we can't listen to uh, so much of the other normative orderings that are going on. So figuring out how to get that right, that's what I think we need to do. Thanks very much. That was 
wonderful and gives us a very different way of thinking about the challenges of building solidarities, um, let alone global solidarities, where I now can't make this microphone work. So I'm going to turn and to ask um, Shay to sort that out. You can have mine if you want. <laughs> well, it's on. Okay. Um, so with that fantastic start, I'm going to turn now to Babatumde or Malola, who may give us a slightly different view um, <laughs> from where, where you're sitting, both geographically and in terms of um, these communicative orders, languages, ontologies. But what's your take on, on how global solidarities might be built and what multilateral development banks might be doing in all of this? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Melissa. And um, I'm very pleased to join the conversation today. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't join you um, there physically uh, at IDS, uh, at Sussex. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm happy to join you uh, virtually. Uh, now, I have some slides to present. I think, Erin, if you uh, could kindly show some of the slides. OK, yeah, uh, next one, please. Um, I believe that um, the global agenda, the 2030 agenda uh, for development, you know, has actually revitalized uh, the demand for multilateral approaches to supporting uh, global development goals in the world. Uh, we are witnessing in the world today all kinds of um, uh, crises, you know, what I call uh, overlapping crises, you know, whether you talk about a conflict uh, going on in Ukraine or you talk about uh, the climate change issues or also the issues surrounding COVID-19 pandemic, which many countries are still uh, recovering from, you will realize that um, uh, multilateralism becomes extremely important to deal with many of these overlapping uh, crises that the world is facing. Uh, in particular, when you look at the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, you look at the fact that they are very holistic, they are agenda for the uh, entire world. Uh, the integrated and interlinked nature of the SDGs also calls out for multilateral approaches uh, to be able to solve many of our uh, challenges around the world. And you current, I mean, when we look at the current uh, flow of financial resources, uh, multilateral actors have been given uh, a very pivotal role uh, to align all financing flows and policies with economic, social, and environmental priorities. Uh, in fact, the United Nations, the World Bank, as well as uh, 200 other multilateral agencies and global funds uh, currently receive about one third of total official development assistance. And when you uh, consider uh, earmarked funding provided also to multilateral organizations, this will go up to around two fifth. Uh, and now when you go back into uh, the global financial crisis, you will realize that when very few institutions were ready to uh, lend at that time, uh, only multilateral development banks were able to come out and help us stabilize the global economy. Uh, they lended approximately $222 billion to countries during the global financial crisis. Uh, which makes uh, the work of multilateral development banks uh, very, very important. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of where we are now, uh, we know as a result of the ongoing crisis that the uh, global community is facing, that multilateral development system is also growing, and it's growing not only as a channel for development cooperation, but as a result of helping to make sure that uh, we deal with a lot of consensus-based approaches for the world. And so this becomes uh, very, very important. Next slide, please. Now, what I want to focus on really for today's uh, conversation, I want to talk about the fact that uh, multilateral organizations are a driving force. And so there are some strengths there and some weaknesses as well. Uh, for multilateral organizations, especially multilateral development banks. So I want to highlight very, very quickly uh, four different strengths. Uh, the first one is that the multilateral development system retains uh, what you can call economies of scale advantages over bilateral aid. 
Uh, that, I think, is a very distinctive strength of multilateral organizations. The second strength is the fact that multilateral organizations also exhibit a stronger degree of uh, specialization than bilateral development partners. The third one is that multilateral organizations make greater use of government channels. And the fourth strength is that multilateral organizations devote greater share of resources to fragile context in terms of dealing with fragile issues around the world. And we have seen that as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which has actually revealed the high degree of interdependence among countries and multilateral stakeholders actually turned the COVID-19 crisis into a very, very uh, veritable opportunity to build a more effective multilateral development system, one that is better equipped to address uh, many of the current global development challenges that I highlighted earlier on. But nevertheless, there are some weaknesses. Uh, let me highlight two weaknesses very quickly. Uh, the first one, is that multilateral organizations, including multilateral development banks, results uh, for funding predictability were more uh, mixed than those of bilateral partners. And this uh, is a major weakness because, of course, uh, it then means that um, certain things that could be done very well by countries uh, might not take priorities as a result of this. Uh, the second weakness, it's the fact that multilateral organizations, including multilateral development banks, devote a smaller share of their funds to multi-sector or cross-country activities than bilateral providers. Uh, this is also another weakness, but what we are seeing significantly today is that multilateral development banks generally are, are, are making sure that significant amounts of their resources are devoted as grants to countries. Uh, and we have seen that during the COVID-19 pandemic, which I led uh, the response for the African Development Bank in the sense that we provided basically grants to our regional economic communities in Africa to be able to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic in Africa. Next slide, please. Now, let me talk through uh, what we are doing at the African Development Bank as a multilateral okay. development bank that is part of the whole uh, equation. Uh, as a bank, of course, we have 81 member states as our members, and uh, we have been around since 1964. And our agenda is actually in terms of five priority areas. One of them is to light up and power Africa in terms of energy. The second one is to feed Africa in terms of uh, agribusiness, but also in terms of dealing with uh, global food crisis. Uh, for instance, as a result of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we approved about $1.5 billion uh, uh, emergency food crisis for Africa. Now, in terms of number three, what we do, we try to integrate Africa as much as possible, especially in terms of trade. Uh, number four, the bank also helps in terms of industrializing Africa. And number five, improving the quality of life for the people of Africa especially in terms of health, in terms of education, in terms of social protection, in terms of eradicating malnutrition throughout Africa. Next slide, please. Now, as a bank, um, we know that our approach is tailored uh, towards pan-African development. And our promotion of development in Africa, of course, also comes with a lot of significant challenges because of the continent's peripheral access to global markets as well as its internal geographical limitations on the movement of people, goods, and services. And so regional integration becomes uh, a very huge issue for us on the continent. You look at the intra-Africa trade as it is right now, it's extremely low. It's only about 15%. And this provides a case for the bank to engage more regional integration for the continent to be able to exploit the uh, benefits of economies of scale, and minimize the influence of borders on the movement of people, goods, and services across the uh, continent. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of what you do as an uh, African Development Bank, as a multilateral development bank in Africa, we work with many regional economic communities in Africa to really improve the living standards of the population of Africa. And in most cases, uh, what we have been doing more recently, especially when there are global challenges and crises, 
uh, we provide more grants to our regional economic communities, especially to low-income countries that are in those regional economic uh, communities across Africa. Uh, and we have been working with the African Union Commission under the Agenda 2063. Uh, we also work with the uh, NEPAD and many uh, other institutions, including the African Continental Free Trade Area uh, in a multilateral way across uh, the continent. Uh, let me mention that the advantage of an African Development Bank as a multilateral development bank uh, in terms of our support in Africa, especially over Western or Chinese aid and loans, is that it is the continent premier multilateral development institution. We're active in all African countries, and we have country presence in 35 countries across the continent. And this gives us a strong local presence that is currently not enjoyed by many other multilateral institutions. Next slide, please. Now, let me begin to sum up my uh, contribution today by saying that multilateral stakeholders can do a lot. And for us to be able to address the global development challenges that we face today, I believe that multilateral development system needs to operate to its full potential and assert its value add. Uh, one way to do this is in terms of transparency. Uh, across and between the multilateral development banks. This will help in terms of effectiveness. It would also help in terms of accountability. And actions, uh, other actions that I believe multilateral development banks can take include the following. Number one, to draw lessons from the multilateral response to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in terms of scale, but also in terms of how we can improve better uh, in terms of responding to future epidemics and pandemics. Number two is to develop an analytical framework to enhance selectivity of operations. And I think what um, Michael presented today shows part of the idea and the kind of analytical framework that we can have. But I think more needs to be done in terms of assessing, but also improving the selectivity of multilateral development finance based on a careful analysis of its complementarity with bilateral official development assistance and other sources of development finance. Number three, I believe that we need to further develop methodologies and tools to assess the financial leverage and mobilization capacity of multilateral development banks. The capacity to use the financial resources of multilateral development banks as leverage to mobilize other sources of finance should be considered as a key comparative advantage uh, of uh, MDBs. Next slide, please. Now, um, I'm going to conclude with this particular slide to say that the future of multilateralism, what is it looking like? What are the remaining reforms that we need to do uh, for making sure that we remain effective, we remain efficient, and we are able to scale our support for countries? I believe that to build back better the multilateral system uh, led by the multilateral development banks should explore ways to make the system fit for purpose to deal with new and emerging development challenges. And to do so, three different areas should be areas of priority. Uh, the first area is in terms of scale. Uh, it's extremely important for multilateral development banks to ensure that we are able to address development challenges that we face, uh, you know, whether about extreme climate uh, change events or pandemics, and funding should be used more strategically and catalytically uh, so that we also support um, uh, domestic resource mobilization uh, in countries, help countries not to get into a um, situation where they are unable to uh, fund their own development agenda. Uh, now, number two, in terms of what we need to do better, it is in terms of efficiency, uh, ensuring value for money uh, in a context of constrained resources. Uh, and we can do this by building on the comparative advantages of the multilateral system that I highlighted earlier on, using greater 
uh, uh, opportunities that we see uh, within government channels around the world. And number three is in terms of accountability. Uh, we need to restore trust uh, in the multilateral development system. Of course, mm -hmm. this will require better communication of the results of what we do and the impact of our work, uh, whether uh, it's at the regional level or global level. So impact uh, uh, results are very, very critical going forward. And that will help us in terms of accountability. And this would also help in terms of transparency, but also it would also help us in terms of being able to do the other two things very well in terms of scale and efficiency. Uh, so uh, again, uh, let me conclude by saying that we are witnessing uh, unprecedented overlapping crises, uh, such that we have never seen before. Uh, we have 100 million people forcibly displaced around the world. Um, the uh, poverty eradication efforts that we did uh, for the last four years, most of those have been eroded because of COVID-19 pandemic. 93 million more people have been pushed into extreme poverty. And so we need to work together within the umbrella of uh, multilateralism to be able to achieve uh, most what could be done because uh, the world uh, it's going in a place in a direction where only joint efforts can make that happen. And multilateral development banks have very critical roles to play in all of these efforts. Thank you so much. Babatunde, thank you so much. I'm going to put that there. I'm going to turn straight over to Stephanie, although I think there's some really interesting connections between what Babatunde said at the end about trust and accountability and the extent to which that also requires communication across multiple orders in the way that, that Michael was alluding to. So have a think about that, but I'm going to turn now to Stephanie to give us a perspective from her long-standing research. Are you going to go to the podium, Stephanie, or do you want to speak from here um, as you choose? Um, on reflecting on the roles, particularly of regional development banks, I think, as well as national ones. So, Stephanie, over to you. And if we could try and keep it within 10 minutes, we will have some time for um, questions from our audience. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, Melissa. It's wonderful to be back at IDS, back from the world of policy making, which is a different world from the academic one. Um, and wonderful to be following Michael and Baba Tude in, in, in their very interesting um, presentations. I want to focus on development banks, uh, both multilateral, regional, national, and subnational. It's what uh, Richard Jolly, former director of the IDS, used to call the slice approach, okay. which is to go from the most global to the most uh, local. Um, and look at development banks as an aspect, both as an aspect of development impact, but, and, and the aim that they pursue, but also as an instrument to pursue development. And I would like to start by highlighting that uh, at the international level, there's been a real renaissance of development banks after the so-called global financial crisis which I prefer to call the North Atlantic financial crisis because that's where it originated. And then of course, through the COVID pandemic, and now these development banks are even more important in view of the difficulties that exist internationally due to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the resulting risks of inflation and recession globally, which is for example reflected in the fact that emerging and developing countries have, are receiving more expensive and more reduced private capital flows. So that the role of development banks becomes of course, even more important. More broadly, private financial markets have more market failures than governments have failures. Uh, and this is, I think, a key insight that actually Stiglitz gave and which, which uh, justifies why public intervention is important. Not because governments and public institutions or development banks are perfect, but because they, have, they are less imperfect than financial markets. And often critics of development banks 
compare them with some kind of perfect institution that doesn't exist, but we should compare them with what options, which are private financial markets that are riddled with imperfections. And these market failures are also very prevalent if we think about uh, processes like the transition to the low carbon and green economy, full of externalities, full of uncertainty, which again, private financing is not very good at dealing with. It's good at dealing with financing activities once the transformations have happened, but it's not so good in dealing with um, the big structural changes which generate so much uncertainty about, about uh, uh, the future uh, development, but also the future short-term profits, which is what they are interested in. And therefore, given these two limitations of private finance, both within financial markets, but also in, in transition to, um, to a green economy, uh, there is a very strong need for development banks. And also, of course, long-term loans, private loans are scarce and expensive, and more, more scarce in critical situations like the current one. And they are particularly expensive for smaller countries, poorer countries, but also at the level of companies, they're more difficult to access for newer companies and more innovative companies and smaller companies. So we have all these asymmetries uh, that make the financing through purely a private system difficult. And we have this urgency, we have these crises that have to be dealt with. As, as people from the ecology world tell us, the planet cannot wait. So we cannot wait for private finance to slowly get round to things, but we need catalyzing forces of development banks. Um, and it's an interesting because, for example, if we look at the North, um, in, in Europe, the European Investment Bank, which is the bank development bank of all the 27 EU countries, um, has, is becoming a green bank. 50% of its loans, as, as, as we saw in a paper that we've written with Marco, who's sitting there, 50% um, of their loans must be to the green economy, to the low carbon economy. And the rest of the loans cannot be, by 2025, and the rest of the loans cannot do anything to undermine that. Similarly, the US Congress and President Biden has approved recently a green federal bank in the US with an initial public capital of $27 billion, which is expected to catalyze lending by three, $300 or $400 billion, uh, which is a, a major change because uh, the United States didn't have a development bank. And now it's created one and one that is green. And many emerging and developing countries are also creating their own national development banks recognizing the important role that they can play for structural transformation. Now, in terms of scale, these public development banks finance about 10% of global investment. So they're big, big actors. If we take all of them, multilateral, regional, and national. In fact, the national ones are the biggest ones. Um, and they, so they have, they represent more than $20 trillion of assets. <laughs> And, and lend around over two, two and a half trillion of annual lending, trillions. So, and they're important, not just in developing countries, not just in emerging economies, but also in the rich developed countries, which also face development challenges of a different kind. And I think what is interesting about these banks is that they provide a balanced approach, which combine both public and private institutions and factors. Uh, this is sort of a new paradigm. Instead of deciding and discussing as we used to do in the past, what is best? What is the role? Uh, is it the role of the state or the market in finance or in other roles? It's better like we try to do in, in, in the research we did with Ocampo and with others is to think of them as complementary and to consider the strength of each of, the, of, of them and how best they can work together. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? 
as, as was done by recently by Baba Tunde, and and then how we, we can build on the strength and how we can work together. An important advantage of development banks is that they are able to leverage, and this was also mentioned by the previous speak, speaker, public resources, fiscal resources to maximize impact on development. Not maximize profits, not maximize lending, but try and maximize impact on development. And in situations like the current ones, where we have fiscal retrenchment all over the world, low growth, high debt levels, and very high inflation rates, public resources become particularly scarce. And development banks can therefore help leverage these public resources particularly well, and have a greater impact on hopefully economic recovery and long-term development. And they can also do this because they, have, they lend at long maturities. So they, they do this through counter-cyclical financing, which is to increase their lending in critical situations, like for example, the COVID crisis, as well as provide long-term resources for structural transformation. I won't talk too much about counter-cyclical measures, although they are very important, um, because uh, I want to focus more on the funding of structural uh, transformation. But I, I want to emphasize that those multilateral banks and national development banks that had sufficient scale, sufficient capital, as Baba Tunde mentioned, were able to respond quicker. For example, the multilateral development bank that, that responded quickest was the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank because it had been given capital, which is based in, in uh, Shanghai, uh, because it had been given capital by its members for the whole decade. So because they had enough capital, and also because they collaborated with the World Bank and Asian Development Bank in funding already prepared projects, they were able to significantly scale up their operation. So two lessons from that, sufficient capital is crucial and, and collaboration within the multilateral system, as well as of course with regional and national development banks. For example, the World Bank response was valuable, but it was much less because they didn't have an increase in their capital. And so that's one of the big lessons that I uh, coincide with the previous speaker, that scale and scale of capital resources available is very important. Uh, why is this important? Because counter cyclical lending is very important to keep investment going in tough times. You don't want to cancel the big programs you have on green transition, um, on infrastructure, on poverty mitigation, just because you have a crisis. So if you have a multilateral development bank or national one lending to you, you can keep the investment going and support the companies and the jobs that would otherwise be, be lost. Uh, secondly, as I said, these long-term loans can help structural transformation key to having a more inclusive and a greener economy. Development banks are also really important in their support for innovation and entrepreneurship in national economies. Stephanie, can you yeah. gradually draw to a close sure. so we have some time for questions? Sure, yeah. but the other speakers will exceed their time. <laughs> um, uh, they can also serve as a bridge between the public and the private sector. And they are very important in funding uh, new sectors and cross-sector projects, what is now called missions, to aid countries to become more dynamic and, and greener. Um, I, I'll, I'll, one of the interesting conclusions, I think, is that we need both uh, multilateral, regional, and national development banks, and that the interaction and the collaboration is particularly crucial. And one of the, another lesson I think, is that some countries like Germany and China actually have very large development banks in proportion to their GDP. And that this has helped a lot, both with the recovery from COVID uh, and with structural transformation. And a very nice example is the development of solar energy, which started to, an important extent in Germany, 
where uh, the development bank, KMW, actually played a very big role in financing uh, solar energy. They were actually the, the only financiers initially. Then the Chinese development bank, to working together with the government and, and the private sector, um, spearheaded a massive, on a large scale, production of solar panels. And this was not only important for China, but it was also important because the large scale enabled the costs to come down very significantly and the research. And therefore, this was a sort of global public good because the rest of the world has also benefited from having very cheap solar panels and cheap solar energy. So uh, just to finish, uh, it's very important that countries have a clear development strategy and that development banks have, uh, have a very clear mandate. Um, I just want to finish with some conclusions very briefly from a meeting of a global meeting of public development banks uh, that happened in Paris. <coughs> the first one I've already mentioned is the issue of scale. And for countries that are very poor, like the African countries, uh, the, we have to find new ways, the international community has to find new ways to fund these development banks. For example, through allocating part of the special drawing rights, which the IMF issues, uh, to capitalize good institutions like the African Development Bank. Um, because if not, these countries may not have enough resources to do that. A second point is that public development banks should incorporate transition to low carbon economies into all their financial decisions and all the project cycles. Um, finally, um, I, I would like to say, I don't really have time for this, that public development banks, of course, need to co-finance with the private sector, but that there are better ways to do it. That there's a sort of hierarchy. They, if they finance themselves in the capital markets, that's very useful. They co-finance with private banks and private investors. But if they use uh, a lot of their resources to try and get a lot of leverage just by giving the best conditions to the private sector, they, they allow them to get the profits and they take on the public contingent liabilities, that is not such a good idea. So a lot of the agenda that you can hear about of uh, going from billions to trillions, you have to be very careful, I think, because um, first, it's not necessarily true that, that, with that you can leverage so much private money. And secondly, you may leave the public sector, which is the citizens in the end of the world with massive liabilities. So the main message is that the development banks to be effective, have to maximize their development impact it's important that they have good financial results. We don't want banks that have losses. But on the other hand, the key criteria is that they should maximize inclusive and green development. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So um, thank you all so much. We've gone a bit over time, but we've had a huge spread through why development banks are important, um, the things that they need, the things they can do that the private sector cannot do, the things that need to be done to enable them to work really well, scale, efficiency, accountability. But then going back to Michael's talk, a kind of prior problem about what actually is the development that the development banks are supporting and how do we get agreement on this in a highly plural world, a pluriverse as it were. So a big array of perspectives. We haven't got very long, but what I'm gonna do is take a round of questions or comments. And if you can try and keep them quite short, and then we will go back to our panel in order and just get some quick responses on those. So um, perhaps we could go first to the online audience while you're in the room thinking of them. So Erin, yeah. perhaps you could give us like two or three. Yeah, great. Ones. We've got two online and they're both for Michael. Uh, very similar questions as well. So what concrete steps can multilateral institutions and other development institutions do to shore up the legitimacy of alternative epistemologies and different ways of understanding the world? Where should we start? <laughs> Um, and secondly, 
what do you think the education that education institutes such as IDS can do to make people able to communicate between those different ontologies and methodologies? Aren't we too much in agreement <coughs> within each of our disciplines and silos to really develop this? What are your suggestions? Okay, great questions. Um, so turning now to the room. Yeah. All right, thank you. So my question is, could you give me the example of emergency support by development bank? Because my image of development bank is mainly on the focusing on the long term project. <coughs> okay, so emergency support's a good one. Yeah, let's get behind that. Yeah. Hi, yeah. My question is in terms you spoke a lot about um these projects and agreements and things like that, what forms of measurable accountability are um, being made within these agreements? Uh, and just examples, I guess. Um, maybe just here, yeah. Um, my question is, what is the difficulty in terms of the coordination between the various banks, institutions like uh, national and the international banks because I thought uh, there are the various policies, national policies and uh, national intentions between the such kind of the institutions. So yeah, how, how to coordinate well and uh, is there any difficulty among these term, this terms of issues? Wonderful. I think we're pro maybe we could just take like, one more if it's quick. Okay. I mean, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. My question, what are the principles that are guiding the work of the um, um, development banks and the multi-institutional uh, multi, uh, multi, uh, bank? Um, for example, if we are talking about the United Nations, their principles are guided by the four principles of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality. So. Okay. Wonderful. So I'm going to go back to Michael, first of all, because there were several for, for you. And actually, if you could give your thoughts on some of these other other questions as well. And then very, very quickly, I'll see if we've got time for Babatunde and Stephanie to okay. chip in also. All right. I'm, just, I'm still working. Yes. Good. Um, First of all, thanks to the University of Bath for making it possible for me to be here. <laughs> I should have said then, everyone's played trains within, but I uh, flew over at the expense of the University of Bath. So if there were anyone from Bath is watching, thank you. No, we're here by thanking you. Um, practical questions first. I think one of the things we can do while you're here at, at IDS is practice communicating in those different modalities. In my class, students have to write three different assignments for three different audiences. <clears throat> one for a popular audience, one for an academic audience, one for a vernacular audience, and one for a government. Those are four different options, they gotta do three. <laughs> but it's just practicing and learning that this is in fact a very different way of communicating, that what counts as a question and what counts as an answer in these different worlds is real. And you'll, you'll learn how to do that the same way you learn how to do anything else, by trying it and not being so good at it, and then get, practicing it again and getting a little bit better. But recognizing that when you're a development person, when you're working in the development world you're going to be especially when you're younger actually it maybe gets a little bit less as you get old when your first decade of being out you'll be in villages talking to villagers who are illiterate who have no understanding of where you've got your education from don't know how to talk the way that you talk when you're talking here how would you convey a lot of these really complicated scientific ideas to people that have no science right so learning how to function and practicing all of those different things i think is uh, is really important um Legitimacy is a, is a big issue that I've, I've just finished a whole big paper with some colleagues at the World Bank on all of this, so I, I don't have time to give that a whole riff on all of that, but, but except to say that I think your legitimacy comes from various different sources, and we have to be much more conscious of those. One is just being uh, practicing what you preach, right? doing, doing what you said you're going to do. <laughs> uh, those, those, those kind of things are really important. Being consistent with professional practice is, it gives you legitimacy. Have, operating where you have a mandate and not where you don't gives you legitimacy. But as, for the, as an extension of what I was saying before, legitimacy also, you earn it. You don't, you, it can be granted to you just by an election, for example, and it grants you powers that you didn't have before. 
but legitimacy can be earned by the, and why I use those the, why the, the Canadian example in particular that legitimacy for, for that hard conversation to go on for three days or three hours around one word so they practice it because they've built they've forged a, a very particular space for these difficult conversations that they've created so can multilateral institutions do that in principle they should be able to do that because the convening is one of the big things that they do when we hold meetings for better or worse people show up how do we how do we manage that space and acknowledge very different normative orders for in, in that space there's not an answer to that there's not a technical fix we wish there was uh, but there isn't there is only the space you create and you enter into respectfully and figure out how to listen and how to speak and how to act and uh, we have to get better. We always have to get better because it's hard and it's not something you can bake into the rules of your organization. It's only something that leaders can do to create as an as a expectation about this is how people like us function when we're doing these kinds of things and we recognize just how hard they are. That's enough for me for now, but thanks for everybody for coming. I know you could be doing something else on, the, on this yeah. afternoon and thanks for being here. Sure. Fantastic. So quick one back to Babatunde, if you just pick up on any of those comments and then just a quick final remark, really. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Melissa, and uh, thanks, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I was a student at IDS myself 20 years ago. I studied under Stephanie. I'm not sure she will still remember me. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I think on some of the questions, let me pick on two of them. One is uh, whether the multilateral development banks formed emergency uh, crisis. Yes, definitely. We do, and at the African Development Bank for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we uh, our board approved uh, a $10 billion COVID-19 crisis response facility through which we uh, supported many African countries, regional economic communities. We, in fact, provided grants to African institutions, such as the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and also to the World Health Organization, Regional Office for Africa, to help uh, stabilize uh, African economies, but strengthen the health systems across the continent and also uh, alleviate the social and economic impact of the pandemic. We also launched a social bond, $3 billion social bond crisis response facility, uh, which was applauded as the largest dollar denominated social bond on the global market as at that time uh, for the crisis. So we do, uh, in fact, for the current um, uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, our board approved $1.5 billion food emergency crisis support for African countries. So my answer is yes, we do. Uh, now, the other question around transparency, uh, yes, there is what you call publish what you fund, uh, which is about looking at the aid uh, transparency of institutions. And uh, so this is uh, uh, published every year. And for this year, the African Development Bank was considered the most transparent institution in the world as a result of publish what you fund. So definitely, uh, this is important. And in terms of coordination, we do coordinate, we work closely with other multilateral development banks to make sure that we don't duplicate efforts, but also to make sure that we leverage capital and then we deal with efficiency as well as um, um, how we do allocation of resources for countries. Again, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I think uh, I look forward to engaging further uh, with all of you. Thank you so much. Great. Stephanie, you get the last word. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful to have a... <coughs> to have a, a student like Babatunde who's obviously done so well, and I'm sure you guys will do as well. Um, so on emergency support, I think the examples that Babatunde gave were excellent, um, but I can give you another one. Uh, the European Investment Bank and the European Commission funded a little known uh, research outfit called BioNTech, who developed the, the vaccine that is now known all over the world, the Pfizer vaccine. So without that funding from the European Investment Bank, we wouldn't have had this wonderful vaccine, which is like a really nice example of a response. And secondly, uh, uh, the question was asked about what are the principles guiding development banks? I think they, they are committed, like the United Nations, to fulfilling uh, the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, but of course, then you have to look at how they implement it, which is a complex thing. Um, I think that one issue that was raised is about the coordination with national governments. I think, I think that is, of course, a sensitive issue. I mean, particularly with the World Bank, there used to be, and the IMF, there used to be a lot of tension between 
uh, borrowing governments and, and these multilateral institutions, and they continue to be. There's been an interesting development because the countries from the South, particularly the Asian countries, because they had a lot of reserves, they created their own institutions, like the BRICS Bank, um, also called the New Development Bank, and also the China-led um, Asia Infrastructure Bank, where they have invited <coughs> the developed countries. But the majority of them are, are, still, um, are still the Asian countries, and particularly the developing countries. And I think a very interesting question, and I'm not quite sure of the answer, uh, interesting for future research, is whether they are really very different because they actually collaborate with, with the World Bank. Is that just in a first phase or will they become mimetized with the World Bank or will they um, you know, provide an alternative uh, to support a different development model? Fantastic. So um, thank you so much to all of our speakers and to all of you from the audience. I think we've had a, a rich array of thoughts this evening. I mean, I'm left with the thought that on the one hand, development banks and multilateral institutions more broadly can do an enormous amount to foster solidarities around pursuing particular development challenges. But there's a deeper problem about agreeing on what those development challenges are and the meanings attached to them and the normative orders that and, and ways of being that are embedded in them, um, which perhaps need to be tackled at a slightly different level. And my question to, to Michael and to these colleagues, which I think we're now gonna to have to pursue afterwards, is how well are development banks um, positioned to do that kind of bridging? Um, or are they forever stuck within one or other of these normative and communicative orders? Anyway, to be discussed and to be reflected on, but thank you so much, all of you, for, for giving us a rich sweep of thoughts and indeed leaving us with questions that we can all reflect on. So just some closing remarks. As always, the recording of this lecture, like all of our Sussex Development Lectures, will be available on the IDS website um, and it will be emailed to those who've attended. So please share with any colleagues who couldn't attend this evening and might have liked to. And I'd encourage you to join us all, not just for one, but for two events next week. So on Wednesday in this usual slot, we have our next Sussex Development Lecture with Ninel Pereira discussing the impact of colonialism in Sri Lanka and the implications of that experience for global solidarities. Um, but we also on Tuesday, the day before that, have a really special event. We have the IDS annual lecture where Yasmin Lari, who is Pakistan's first female architect and a superb bridger of the worlds of design, um, practice, um, academia, um, will be talking to us about architecture for development. So that's going to be a super special event. Again, please do join us and encourage your colleagues. So finally, once more, with apologies for having gone on slightly late, but it was worth it, a big clap to all of our speakers. Thank you. <laughs>